Hello, hello, hello. This is Doc Ito inviting everyone to break out their high-vis orange vests and camo trousers because it's time for episode 18 of the Civ Battle Royale X Season 3, Hunting Season. Blood spills throughout the globe as several of the cylinder's heavyweights seize the opportunity to bully their smaller neighbors. We see the death of some old rump states and the birth of some new ones. Hello, CBR fans. The name's Top Hat Paladin, longtime fan, first time narrator. You might remember me as the author of this season's Zulu mod, or the co author of Tuva, but today I'm here as your guide to episode 18. Strap on your seat belts and let's get to it. Props to Ferreira for his consistency with these high quality maps. These things are always a great resource and a treat to look at. Explosive Watermelon brings us this week's OC. I wholeheartedly echo Chalmers' sentiment in the image. Good lord, what is happening in Australia? This will be a big region to watch this week due to the tangled web of wars that crisscross the continent. As always, a huge thank you to our Ko-Fi donors. Your support has been instrumental in allowing the CBR to continue for so many iterations. The top three sieves slid around the power rankings this week. The rankers lost a bit of confidence in Turkey, causing it to slide down to third, and in its place, Tuva has reclaimed the number one spot. Their lead is a precarious one, Brandenburg and Turkey are both nipping closely at Tuva's heels, but as a totally unbiased, I promise, observer who's got the bully pulpit this week, I'm going to take this opportunity to say, Tuva sweep, here we go, baby, there's no stopping us now! Now, before we get down to brass tacks, we've also got a look at the government overview. Since we last checked in, Rauni Metuktire's government has moved past traditional forms of factionalism and adopted party politics. Currently, it appears that the Kayapo megacities are in the hands of the Socialist Left Party. Other than the Kayapo, the Cree are the Cylinder's only merchant league, and they've got some news to report as well. After securing the Kwak capital of Tiguashti, Poundmaker has awarded himself the title of Prince of the Kwakwakuwaku. Willie Seaweed is sure to be annoyed about this, but he doesn't have much recourse to fight back about it. Scrolling through the list of military dictatorships, we can also see that Ethan Allen has taken on the title of Strategos. This title indicates that Ethan Allen has taken the partial equity and might-based legitimacy reforms. Partial equity reduces unhappiness per city, but increases unhappiness from population. Might-based legitimacy increases sovereignty when all cities have a unit garrison. Since Vermont controls all of one city, partial equity won't do much good, but it should be easy to meet the might-based legitimacy condition and speed up their rate of collecting reforms. Just like we saw with Poundmaker before, we can see that Pretty Nose has adopted a title to reflect the enemy capital that she's captured. Specifically, she's declared herself the Dictator of the Comanche, making no secret of her intent to crush the Comanche population underfoot. Government Overview superfans will recall that Frederick Williams' self-appointed anti-barbarian title was already in force in episode 15, scene 37, so I'll avoid rehashing the analysis there and instead give a shout out to the three monastic orders visible on this slide. Two of the monk led sieves are Tetuan and the Normans. Apparently, there's something in the depths of the Mediterranean that drives its sailors into the church. Finally, we can see that Olive Yang has crowned herself Emperor of the Romans. This surreal choice of title was recently highlighted by Explosive Watermelon, 
who posted a Kokang Roman Empire flag on the subreddit recently. We can also see a few peasants' republics on the map, Cambodia, Egypt, and Kievan Rus. Olga is probably the most robust looking of these civs, which isn't a great omen for the long-term survivability of this government type. And now into the action. We start this episode in earnest by examining the ongoing Mali-Tetuan War, where it's clear that Tetuan's monastic government is poorly equipped for warfare. Fez is solidly in Malian control, and Mali's Tontigi cavalry is camping at the gates of Tetuan's eponymous capital city. Saida does have some units ready to defend the city, but they're pretty poorly positioned, so she'll need luck on her side if she wants to keep Tetuan. Meanwhile, in Asia, we see our two Chinese sieves at each other's throats. Emperor Wu has mostly cleared out Yonglei's ground forces, and while the Ming fleet is respectable, a fleet won't be able to prevent the Han from besieging the inland city of Nanjing. Last episode, the Kree were flipping the Kwok city of Esipit. Now they've seized Mimkumlis as well, allowing them to reinforce their capture better. And honestly, this seems like a wise pickup for the Kree in general. The fighting around Esipit could still go either way, but Mimkumlis is pretty much impossible for Willy to retake at the moment. In addition to their war against the Kwakwakuwaku, the Kree were laying siege to the Modoc capital at Captain Jack's stronghold, but it's the Mojave who grab a knight and snipe the city for themselves. With this capture, Kintpuash of the Modoc is eliminated in 55th place. The Modoc were never an especially robust competitor. From the start, they were slow to expand, but they were especially neutered after unnecessarily ceding their second city, Agawesh, to the Quaks. Writing their eulogy is Denis von Wiesen, a playwright who was highly influential in Russian literary comedy. But if he's unlucky, the Mojave will kill him too before he can present it. Down in Australia, Timor-Leste keeps the pressure on the Yongu. This war was something of a flip-fest last episode, since Timor had no ground forces and Yongu had no navy but Timor is now reaping the benefits of its stronger production base. Wangu is rapidly running out of land units, and Zanana still has plenty of ships to throw at the front. Milingimbi might flip once more, but if Zanana is smart, then he'll definitely be able to own it by war's end. In Central Asia, we can see Ahmad Shah Durrani luxuriating in his sprawling Afghan empire. He's happy to show off to foreign dignitaries, including caravans from Yemen, Bengal, the Gokturks, the Permians, Han, Vladimir, and the Masagete, plus no fewer than four Indonesian scouts. Durrani credits his success in part to the role of Friedrich Bayer, a great merchant who in our world founded the pharmaceutical giant Bayer the inventor of aspirin. Not content with kicking the Ainu off of mainland Asia, Buman Kagan has begun laying siege to their capital city on Hokkaido. However, while Buman is doing quite a lot of damage to Sat Poropet, he has no shot at taking the city unless he brings a melee unit to the front. Maybe the Karak near Kangu Tarman, or the one at port in Kashgar. The Wirajuri Maori War rages on, with Windradine launching an assault on Patatau's final Australian city, Marakawai. The Maori have only a skeleton crew defending the city, so it's probably just a matter of time before this outpost is waving the Wirajuri banner. Up north, we can see the Yangu launching their counteroffensive against Milingimbi. They're poised to retake the city, but will they be able to keep it? The Pandya have retaken their island colony of Tutukudni, 
which Kilwa had briefly captured last episode. This city will probably remain in Pandya's hands for the foreseeable future. Without the element of surprise, Kilwa simply has too little manpower in this part of the world. By contrast, while the Pandya Empire is small, it's fairly well carpeted. In unrelated news, the Kree and Mojave have made peace with the remaining Modoc units, so it seems Denis von Wiesen will be free to continue writing his plays. Riding high off his elimination of the Philippines, Suharto decides to press his luck by declaring war on Kokang. According to the latest stat sheet, Kokang only has two-thirds the military manpower that Indonesia does, and at first glance, the Indonesian military seems to be more navally focused than Kokang's. However, the raw numbers obscure the fact that Indonesia's forces are pretty widely scattered. It'll be an uphill battle for Suharto to walk out of this war with many gains, especially if he also wants to keep Cavite el Viejo. Born and raised in Normandy, Robert Giscard first traveled to Sicily as a mercenary and was so successful that he managed to establish his own kingdom in the region. And now he's apparently bored of the kingdom he founded, so he's ditched the Mediterranean and is offering his services to Botswana. At Giscard's direction, Botswana has built up a sizable army in its northern stretches, but interestingly, both Botswana and the Zulu seem to be hanging back from the battlefield right now. Besides a small skirmish north of Nongoma, this showdown has devolved into a cold war. Buman Kagan listened to my advice and procured a melee unit. A Gokturk caravel goes swooping in to capture Sat Poropet. The Ainu have a handful of units nearby, so they may yet retake their capital, but we can see that Buman has also moved his carracks into more useful positions. Unless Shakushane makes a very carefully timed peace deal, I predict that the city will ultimately end up in Gokturk hands. Also, wow, Willie Seabeat is really pumping out those Hamatsa dancers. Wangu retakes Milengimbi. The Timorese navy still has plenty of units at its disposal, but none in the immediate vicinity of the city. The Yangu should try to get out of this war while their losses are minimal. The panel in the upper left reminds us that Timor-Leste is at war with both the Yalngu and the Wirajuri, and now that Galiwinku is securely Timorese, there's a Timor-Wirajuri land border. However, the only unit interested in waging war along that border is a single Wirajuri knight who's marching around in Galiwinku's exurbs. The Ming are gathering all their forces to defend Nanjing, including some high-tech Shenji musketeers, but I think their biggest defensive asset is actually that one-tile lake west of the city. This small body of water is preventing the massive Han invasion force from assaulting the Ming capital in every direction at once. Shakushen retakes his capital with a trireme thus sparing both of his swordsmen on Hokkaido. He's playing this wisely. By dragging out the flip fest as long as possible, he maximizes his odds of persuading Boomin to give up and let him keep his capital. The Muisca establish Funza on the island of Bermuda. This city is wholly undefended, so if Roosevelt decides to mobilize that galleon fleet along the eastern seaboard, it's pretty sure to flip. Still, looks cool though. Elsewhere in the Atlantic, we can see a handful of Gokturk scouts floating around, looking for other islands to claim. As the Ming continue their defense of Nanjing, they procure a treasure fleet. This unique Great Admiral has extra sight and can purchase city-states, so for a defensive war on a map with no city-states, it's effectively a regular Great Admiral for them. Nanjing's health is continuing to chip away, 
It's gone from high yellow to low yellow since last turn, but the Ming ground forces are growing, so they may still have a chance to turn this campaign around. Tetuan has dropped to half of its health, and Mali has some Carracks nearby to deal the finishing blow if it comes to that. Thus far, it looks like Sundiata is being pretty scrupulous about mopping up Tetuani melee units as well. Has he finally learned from his past series of humiliations against Saida? I won't blame anyone for forgetting that the Ming and Inca were at war. I'd certainly forgotten myself, but Tupacupanqui remembers. He's discovered that the Ming colonized Hawaii, and he's not happy. Guiyang will be hard for the Inca to attack, since it only borders one water tile, but the Inca may have enough galleons to brute force the city regardless. Marakawai burns. While the Maori do have one melee unit nearby, the Toa there is a long swordsman replacement, its health is probably too low for it to retake the city. Thus, I can say confidently, the Maori have been driven entirely off of Australia. However, Windradine cannot claim to be overlord of the continent until he deals with the Timorese, who, as we can see at the top edge of the image, have taken Milangimbi again. In the heart of the Amazon lies the sprawling socialist megalopolis of Kermoro, from which Rauni Metuktire rules the Kayapo de Menz. Rauni is also renowned as a patron of the arts. Visible in this shot are all three types of cultural great person, and Rauni has just completed the Uffizi, a museum where he hopes to showcase their work. We now zoom out to look at the South American continent more broadly. The Kayapo and Inca have a lengthy but peaceful border. To the north, we also see the Muisca, who seem quite happy with their captured port city of Bau. However, the Kayapo don't seem interested in retaking the city at the moment. Instead, they're content to listen to the romantic pianist Louis Moro Gottschalk. With Esipit and Mimkumlis firmly secured, the Cree are proceeding further westward, trying to find the best way to attack Zhuok. The Kwakwakawaku defenses are pretty thin on the ground here. It seems like Willie is just relying on Alaska's naturally defensive geography. The sheer numbers of the Han army have overwhelmed the Ming's Shenji musketeers. Nanjing has fallen. Yongle has a handful of land units still around, but with his closest melee units taking substantial damage, I don't think he has great odds of retaking his capital. The Ming's back might be broken. Resentful that their handiwork is always being shipped to the Polynesian colonies, a group of disgruntled Incan artisans has taken up arms in the mountains south of Olantaytambo, Normally, longswords are only issued to elite Incan soldiers who undergo special training to enter the ranks of the Chasca Chukwi. However, these rebels are a motley group who have no particular expertise with the weapon. They may cause a mess, but they won't be an existential threat to the regime. Olive Yang overhears that some sieves are settling the Antarctic and reasons well, if they're doing that, there must be something down there that's worth owning. Consequently, she settles Manton Par on one of the more livable outcrops and sends another settler south to follow it. The land war between Botswana and the Zulu is still pretty quiet. There are skirmishes around Nongoma and Maun, but they're mostly inconclusive. However, the Zulu Navy could be making a significant play. A flotilla of Carracks is converging on Saroe, and while Botswana has a handful of galleasses around, they don't have the kind of reinforcements that the Zulu do. 
Could Sechuayo be reviving the idea of the backdoor squad? Ireland has been resting on their laurels in Oviedo, but the war with Castile never ended. A fleet of galleasses travel north to Brittany to re-besiege Oviedo, and some jinetes are tagging along to deal the finishing blow. Will this city continue to flip back and forth, or does Collins just want to wash his hands of it? Tupac Yupanqui's fleet is converging on Guiyang, but he hasn't yet figured out how to handle the city's narrow harbor. Despite their naval superiority, the Inca have done only trivial damage to the city. With Canute eliminated, Brandenburg has attained uncontested control of the Scandinavian peninsula. The Brandenburgers have also built up an impressive fleet with wall-to-wall -wall carracks throughout the Skagerrak. Examining Frederick William's empire makes it clear why he's a top three civ in the power rankings, but I'd love to see him finish building his ships and start putting them into action. There's a fun time paradox on this slide. The message at the top of the screen announces that a citadel has been built near Chongjin, but if we look to the northeast of Chongjin, we can see that the great general hasn't been removed from the map yet. It looks like the Ming have grabbed a couple of tiles on the Korean peninsula, thanks to Kaifeng, and the North Koreans are seizing that land for themselves. An understandable choice, though personally I'd rather see North Korea resolve this one with outright warfare. In the corner of the slide, we can also see that Sat Poro Pet is back in Gokturk's hands. Iritaba of the Mojave is also making use of citadels. He's grabbed the western and southern outskirts of Agawesh for himself. However, citadels aren't the only thing that Agawesh has to worry about. Pretty Nose has just declared war on the Kwakwakawaku. Hamatsa dancers aren't going to be much help against the Arapaho musketmen now crossing the Rockies. Thus far, the Kokang-Indonesia War seems to be waged purely on the high seas. Some ships are engaged between Muse and Cavite El Viejo, while others are operating northeast of Malolos. In scene 35, we saw that Indonesia wasn't in a golden age as of last turn, which means they can't currently use their para-dropping boats ability. Consequently, Suharto is forced to use frontal attacks like everybody else. Also, notice on the sidebar that the Gok Turks and Ainu have made peace. The Gok Turks still hold the Ainu capital of Satporo Pet, which means Shakushane has been reduced to one city. A clear sign that the Yongu are screwed. Timor Leste is about to lose Milingimbi to the Wira Juri. As a matter of fact, it appears that Wangu has literally zero land units still living. If he puts his mind to it, Zanana Guzmao could probably eliminate the Yongu without much trouble. The Eastern Front, now the only front, of the Wirajuri Maori War seems pretty moribund. Potatau isn't making much effort to retake Horahora and Windradine shows no interest in taking any of the other Maori cities. He seems more focused on completing the unification of his continent instead. The America-Greenland War is also a bit of a stalemate these days. Plenty of ships have damaged or sunk each other, but no city is even scratched right now. I'm inclined to blame this impasse on lack of focus. A concerted push could potentially lead Greenland to take Montpellier or America to take Egeres Minde. Meanwhile, while poor Vermont has a carpet, it's a hopelessly outdated one. Oviedo falls to Castile. Though there's one Irish pikeman on Brittany and an Irish carrick nearby, Michael Collins isn't in much of a position to repulse the Castilian advance. 
Also, I've just realized that the layout of cities prevents anyone from settling Cornwall. That might hamper Castile's ability to press the offensive here. If you two can't agree on who gets Milingimbi, then nobody will get it. With this pronouncement, Windredine seizes the hotly contested city and sets fire to it. The city only has one citizen left, which means unless Zanana can retake it within the turn, which, to be fair, is a possibility, Milingimbi will be raised into nothing. Bizarrely, Botswana has chosen not to mobilize its Gallius fleet, thus allowing Setshwayo to attack Seroe with near impunity. The on-land portion of the Botswana-Zulu war is still inconclusive, but unless Seretse Khama gets his house in order, he'll wind up losing a city to this naval offensive. Shuja Uddin Muhammad Khan the ruler of Bengal has constructed Versailles, a wonder that provides two great work of art slots and plus 10% maximum sovereignty. We're also taking this opportunity to examine Chittagong, a Sumatran outpost that has been remarkably secure despite being almost entirely surrounded by Indonesia. Bengal has managed to avoid any existentially threatening wars, thanks in part to the mountains separating it from Kokang, so it's been able to amass large cities like this in a relaxed manner. We now zoom out from Chittagong to examine Southeast Asia more broadly. The indonesia kokang War continues to be a meat grinder, but it's important to note that Kokang is also at war with Cambodia. This war has also been pretty quiet thus far, but once Olive Yang takes out the front line of Cambodian pikemen, her tech advantage should carry her pretty smoothly to the gates of Phnom Penh. Even in these hard times, Cambodia can at least enjoy the work of Shinichiro Watanabe, the anime director responsible for Cowboy Bebop and Samurai Champloo. Despite their best trebucheting efforts, the Ming army has been unable to retake Nanjing. Partial credit here has to go to the North Korean scout, a neutral party who's blocking the main road to the city. Wu is confident enough in his control of Nanjing that he's progressed to Fuzhou, the westernmost city in the Ming Empire. The one-time Mughal Emperor Akbar has stepped up as a great general for Mali. However, we seem to have gotten the less competent Akbar from CBR Mark II, given that the city of Tetuan doesn't seem to have taken any damage since the last time we were over here. Furthermore, Saida has replenished her navy. While it might be too late for her to retake Fez safely, she's well positioned to recapture Tetuan if it flips. Sundiato was looking good for a while there, but he could still blow it. A single Timorese caravel is attacking the remote Wirojuri city of Mengu Ganai. A doomed effort, but I respect the chutzpah. Sundiata settles Bure on a one tile landmass that I think is Ascension Island. This isn't likely to do him a whole lot of good, but I guess it at least prevents his rivals from making it into a forward base later. In the Polynesian fringes of the Incan Empire, a publisher named James Harper begins the firm that would eventually grow into HarperCollins. Meanwhile, Olive Yang discovers to her frustration that she can't settle Fiji without infringing on someone's territorial waters. Zanana Guzmao managed to recapture Milingimbi before Windradine could burn it completely to the ground. The Wiradjuri still have a few knights in the vicinity, but Guzmao doesn't seem too concerned about them. Instead, he's moving on to the Yongu capital of Yerkala. A few trepidatious carracks are the only thing protecting Wangu from annihilation right now.
Also, you might be wondering why there are workers and great generals with the round icon of combat units. That's because Timor-Leste's UA, in which religious units grant a combat strength bonus to adjacent units, also affects units whose initial combat strength is zero. The Ming and Inca make peace, with Guiyang remaining safely in Yongle's hands. I suppose Tupac Yupanqui has judged the city to be more trouble than it'd be worth. This trireme, trapped to the east of Hawaii, is possibly the only Central American unit we've seen all episode, even though we were over in Bermuda in Scene 29. It's not the Kowloon-esque super city that Cromoro is, but Mekrognoti is a highly impressive metropolis in its own right, and now a metropolis that boasts the Taj Mahal. The happiness boost will be useful given the Kayapo's immense population, and a golden age is, of course, always appreciated. And the Kayapo wonder accumulation spree can continue, thanks to the emergence of their great engineer, Genyo Takeda. In our timeline, Takeda was one of the lead designers of the Nintendo Wii. Given Kayapo's runaway tech lead, they might hire him for a similar role here. The hazardous terrain of the Rockies has prevented the Arapaho from doing much damage to Agawesh so far, the Arapaho have sent a Beni Inen, yes, three eyes, to the front line, but as it's a night replacement, it's not well optimized for attacking a city. Still, while the Arapaho offensive has been slow moving so far, their statistical lead is hard to deny. Pretty Nose just needs to keep the pressure on. At the other end of the Kwakwakwaku Empire, we can see that Zhuok has only taken minor damage so far. Again, rough terrain proves to be Willy's biggest ally here, since he's pumping out his unique scouts at the expense of any unit with appreciable combat strength. Yerkala Falls. Not only does this add a second capital to the Timorese Empire, it also means that Wangu of the Yongu has been eliminated in 54th place. Wangu was quick to doom himself to being the junior partner of the Australian duo, as Windradine had been much more enthusiastic about settling. Instead, the Yongu built up a small core, but with a defensive army that protected them throughout past Wirajuri Yongu wars. However, once Wangu's navy fell into obsolescence, Timor-Leste was able to launch a seaborne invasion that ground the Yongu into nothing. Sechuayo's naval strategy worked. The Zulu take Saroe and set the city ablaze. The Tswana army consists mostly of ranged units and knights, so they'll have trouble retaking it. However, these forces have been able to keep the Zulu ground forces at bay, so Saroe probably isn't the beginning of a serious collapse. Botswana's only other coastal city, Francistown, is protected by a wall of galleuses, so that will be a tough nut to crack from the sea. Realistically, I expect that Saroe will be the only city such while flips in this war. Kim Il-sung had such a fun time dropping his last citadel that he's decided to do it again. This time, he planted the citadel on Jeju Island, thereby seizing the northern stretches of Kaifeng's territorial waters. I wonder if North Korea is planning to attack Mori again. The newly Korean sea lanes provide a new angle of access to Mori sea space. The Han vanguard begins attacking Fuzhou in earnest, but this vanguard consists mainly of knights, so it's little surprise that Fuzhou has taken only minor damage. Meanwhile, Nanjing continues to languish in red health, although Ming doesn't seem to be able to project enough power to retake it. The North Korean scout, meanwhile, is proceeding south toward the Kokang border. 
He's heard that some crazy things are legal down there. Unsatisfied with Akbar's generalship, Mali has added Kanakuisi, in our timeline, a Mohawk war chief and mediator, to their command structure. I can't blame Sundiata for changing tax here. Not only has Tetuan failed to fall, but the city's health is trending upward. Despite how many Malian units are up by Fez, they seem unable to project power as far north as the Tetuani capital. Down in South Africa, Botswana is putting a solid amount of pressure on the Zulu ground forces near Ulundi. At the same time, the Zulu advance toward Francistown seems to be collapsing. It might be about time for Setswayo to take Saroe and go home before the war's tide starts to turn. Mali continues its expansion into the South Atlantic by settling Bambuk, this one seems to be built on St. Helena. The seas around Bambuk are thick with crabs, so the appeal of this island, unlike Bore, is pretty apparent. With his brutal conquest of the Yongu, Zanana Gusmao has attracted the attention of Cesare Borgia, who enrolls in his service as a great general. Gusmao is probably happy to have this general on his side, as the Wiradjuri are continuing to attack the Timorese territories in Australia. In particular, an expeditionary force is closing in on Galiwinku. Zanana also celebrates his recent victories by building a wonder, Hamandar Sahib, in his capital city of Dili. This wonder gives its owner culture for every merchant specialist. We've seen Timor-Leste pumping out great merchants in the recent past, so it does indeed seem like they'll get good mileage out of this one. The Irish are deploying a new kind of ship, cry the panicked lookouts at Oviedo. I'd recognize that green banner anywhere. Their commander grabs the telescope and looks for himself before ultimately saying, Those crewmen aren't Irish. In fact, I don't know who they are. We have more information than this commander, though. This ship, we can assert confidently, is a Kayapo privateer. In any case, now that the newcomer is proven not to be an Irish invasion force, Isabella is comfortable sending her armada north to the Irish Sea. Don't come back, she tells them, unless you can bring me Dublin. Though the Inca put down their artisans' uprising earlier, a copycat rebellion springs up along the Inca-Muisca border. In particular, these disaffected longswordsmen are attacking Guatavita. As with their precursors, they're a nuisance to the major sieves, but not more than that. We also get an actual image of Central American territory. That trapped trireme isn't alone. The size of the Arapaho army has allowed them to overrun the defenders of Agawash. The city still holds on by a thread, but it's surrounded by melee units, so it's sure to fall in just a turn or two. Willie Seaweed talks the Cree into a peace deal. In order to secure his survival, he also throws in Tsasis Nukomi as a gift, but Poundmaker, unimpressed, sets the city on fire. Zwalk, meanwhile, wasn't offered in the peace deal, but was actually captured by force. It, too, is now burning. However, the real cause of this peace deal isn't anything to do with the Cree. Instead... As a final insult to the Arapaho, Willie Seaweed gives away Agawesh to the Cree just seconds before Pretty Nose was about to capture it. I respect the spite. Azike, leader of the formerly top-ranked Permians, misses being the top dog on the cylinder. 
So when he sees the currently top-ranked Tuva declare war on the Masagete, Azike naturally mimics him. To become number one, you first need to think like a number one. This is, of course, bad news for Tomyris. Although she has plenty of units, the majority of them are pretty outmoded. As for the two invaders, the Permians seem most able to win big here. The main tuva Masagete border is obstructed by Lake Balkash, forcing Kular to funnel through a narrow passage or deal with the hassle of embarking to reach any Masagete cities. Conversely, Azike is well positioned to attack Tamiris from multiple sides. Finally, I note the southern Tuvan exclave of Ishba, a poorly defended bit of border gore that's likely to end up in Masagete hands when all is said and done. Lately, Akhenaten has been trying to just keep his head down and avoid getting killed. For a while, this strategy was working pretty well, but now the Angolans have just announced, hey, these guys are still kicking around in Northeast Africa. Can Angola personally do much about it? Not really. But if the call to action alerts Chad, then Egypt's peaceful days might be over. After his successful war against the Ainu, Buman Kagan has been looking for another weak sieve to pick on, and now he's found a promising target in the Kwakwakuwaku. Willy Seaweed has three cities left, and each one has a lengthy border with the Gokturks. The Kwaks will need a serious dose of luck and some smart plays to make it out of this war alive. As Nanjing steadily recovers, Wu ramps up the intensity of his siege of Fuzhou. His attack force has shrunk from what it was at the start of the episode, but it's still strong enough to be doing some serious damage to Fuzhou and its two-unit defense force. Kilwa accepting the fact that they don't have the manpower to threaten Tutukundi anymore, gives up and makes peace with Pandya. As much as she's probably happy to be done with the war, I can't help but imagine Ali Rani is also a little lonely in peacetime. She's in a pretty isolated corner of the world. Peace still reigns in South America, where the Kayapo have gotten bored of Gottschalk's piano work and are instead captivated by Vincenzo Bellini's operas. However, the peace is not absolute. In the far northwest corner, it appears that the Moisca are still struggling with their barbarian uprising. Azike's army is composed in large part of Batirs, unique knights that can attack twice if they've captured a religious unit at the turn before and who turn into a settler if killed during a golden age. However, Tamiris is fairly irreligious, and I have no idea whether the Permians are in a golden age, so let's just think of them as knights for now. Specifically, knights who are about to cross lances with Tamiris's own cavalry in an internecine joust across Central Asia. Semiramis confirms my speculations. When Robert Giscard took on a generalship with Botswana, it wasn't out of the goodness of his heart, but as a reconnaissance gathering mission. He's now plotting against Botswana, but given the vast distance between Botswana and the Norman lands, the plot may be a bit stillborn. In our last look at Southern Africa tonight, we can also see that the Botswana-Zulu War has returned to a stalemate. The indonesia Kokang War, however, is a former stalemate that's now heating up. Now that he's fielding galleons, Suharto has punched through the Kokang fleet and is launching a full-throated naval siege of Muse. This theater will be worth watching in the next episode. This episode's final look at the Bering Strait region 
shows that Boomin has almost immediately plunged Jawadi into the red, understandably given that the city is defended by embarked scouts. We can also see that Poundmaker has stopped his raising in order to bring Tsatsis Nukomi and Swalk fully into the Cree fold. And now we're on to our very final scene of the week. This one takes us to Central Asia, where the Permian Tuva Joint Invasion Force is still in the early stages of its attack. The first city to take damage, therefore, is the isolated Izma. Kular's feelings for this city seem to begin and end with apathy, so he probably won't be too shaken if he loses it. As his creator, though, I'm hoping the defenders of Ishma manage to pull through. And that brings us to the end of episode 18. Once again, I've been Top Hat Paladin. I hope you've enjoyed the narration, and it's been a pleasure to take you through this week's edition of the CBR. And with that, we've bagged our limit of capitals and sieves for the week. This is Doc Ito, hoping you'll join me in a 21F salute to our fallen heroes. Farewell, you mediocre bastards. <laughs>